Hey everyone, today I'm going to show you how to create a VPN using WireGuard. Why do we want a VPN? Well, it's going to allow us to remote in to our home lab, connect to services securely, and provide that remote admin assistance that your family is going to require. Not only that, all the hard work that you've put into your home lab, it means you can share that with other people securely. So whilst you may want to expose services like your Plex or your Jellyfin using the inbuilt tools, you may also want to put that behind a VPN so that you can have confidence that it's only exposed to those people that you want to give access to. So why do we want to use WireGuard? Well, it's rapidly established itself as the de facto VPN solution. And there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, it's built into the Linux kernel so it's readily available and Mr. Linux himself, Linus Torvalds, if he gives it a thumbs up, it's usually a good sign that it's pretty decent. Speed, because it's native in the OS and it's lightweight, the code base is tiny compared to OpenVPN and speed tests confirm that the line rate is faster using WireGuard than OpenVPN. It uses the latest encryption standards out of the box. It's easier from an auditability perspective because as I said, that code base is much smaller, it's much newer, and it's built for modern technologies. And lastly, this applies to both, it's super easy to deploy within Docker. So let's go ahead and have a look at the config file. So if you head over to my GitHub, you'll find the config file there. And I've added the comments from the containers website itself into the config, so you've got those readily available. But it's pretty straightforward. We specify the host name, for our WireGuard service, so yourdomain.com. We have some optional things that we can change. I'm gonna leave them as default for this setup, but you feel free to change them in line with the comments as you see fit. Let's quickly have a look. So we've got the password. This isn't the password that WireGuard uses. No, it does those on the fly when you create a new user. This is the password for the web GUI, that's right. Normally with WireGuard, you typically manage it through the command line interface, which is fine, but it's not the most intuitive, it's not the easiest, especially when you're going to need to be copying keys or scanning QR codes. So, this container gives you the benefit of a full web GUI, and it's excellent. It's really lightweight, it's really snappy, it's really fast, and it will get you up and running with multiple users in a few seconds. So let's continue our review. We can specify the port that WireGuard's going to use. I'm just gonna leave this default. I recommend you do the same. This is the port external to the container. As the comment says, internally, it will always use 51820. And I recommend you keep the port the same, just because the applications that will be using WireGuard typically will be looking for that default port. So it's gonna save you some hassle, and there aren't any other applications I'm aware of that use that port, so everything should behave nicely. The next one is the default IP range. So what that means is when you connect to your client, you're going to be served an IP address from that range. And it will increase each time a client is added to the server. Next up is the allowed IPs. Now, this isn't the IPs that are allowed to connect to WireGuard, like you might think. No, these are the IPs on your internal network that WireGuard clients are allowed to connect to. So here you're going to want to specify the network ranges in your internal network that people can connect to. So for example, if your home lab's running on 192.168.0.1 slash 24, that's what you're going to add here. So that will grant anyone who connects through WireGuard access to any services on that network range. The rest of the commands in the optional section, we're not going to touch on, but go to the website and read up if you need those. After that, it's pretty straightforward. We're specifying the WG Easy image. We're specifying some ports. We're giving it a volume mount that's locally mapped to our host. That's where it's going to store the client profiles, i.e. the keys that are associated with those users. And this will make it super easy to back up. And if you follow my previous videos, we can do that with Restic. Finally, this is going to require some special permissions to run because it has some quite advanced networking so we need to add the net admin and the sys module. So let's go ahead and jump into deployment. So if you've been following my videos so far, I've just created another folder 
within our Docker Compose folder. I've just called it WG Easy to make it easy. Inside there, I have a Docker Compose file, and this is just a copy of the GitHub config we've just walked through. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to tweak that for your setup, but just for testing, this will probably work. Just make sure that the volume mount has your username, assuming you're not using Docker. So once you have this configured and tweaked, let's SSH into our Docker server and spin this up. So let's move to that directory and let's spin the container up. Now, as I mentioned, there's a web GUI for this. So the web GUI is gonna be available on your Docker VM IP and the port's gonna be 51821. So the command line says that this is complete. Let's go and see if that's right in the browser. Now, as we didn't specify a password, we're straight in. It's probably a good idea to password this because anyone who gets access to these keys could potentially have remote access into your network. So if you're pushing this out for production, make sure that you add a username and password. But for now, let's have a quick look in this UI. So it's really straightforward to use. Let's go and add a new client now. It's as simple as clicking new client. So we'll give this a name. We'll hit create. And there we go. It says me, James, I'm going to be given the IP 10.8.0.2. So anytime I connect, that's the internal IP address, not on your internal network. This is inside the Docker container. Don't worry about that. But if you were to add another client, they would be 10.2.0.3 and so on. Now what you're thinking is, well, how do I use this? Well, you can either download the WireGuard app for Windows or Linux, or like me, I primarily use this on my phone. Now I use it on my phone because it means that when I'm on 5G, 4G, whatever, I can actually VPN back into my home network and have all the advantages of having my firewall protecting my traffic, being able to do DNS resolution through my Pi hole, which has all the nasty stuff blocked. Plus I get access to lots of my systems and services. I can do a bit of remote admin and check up on things like my CCTV cameras, which I don't want to publish to the web. And I'm sure there's a whole load of other things that you would want access to, but don't want to expose to the internet. So to do this on your phone or any camera enabled device is pretty straightforward. Simply hit this QR button here, and that's a QR code of your keys and all your data for connecting to this server. However, you can also hit the download button and that's gonna download that configuration file for you to store somewhere. Or if you're using something like a Windows and you don't have a webcam, you can just import that through the WireGuard app. So now that we have this running locally, we obviously need to configure it for remote access. Now, I can't give you a walkthrough of how to do that for every firewall. But effectively, you're going to need to port forward this. So I'll show you how to do this using Sophos XG, which is what I use and what I've been using throughout these videos. But just have a look how to forward a port on your firewall or your ISP router. It should be pretty straightforward. You're just going to want to forward any traffic on port 51820 to the IP address of your Docker VM. If you wanted to, you could also forward this to your proxy and route it through your proxy. So I use traffic. You can set up a UDP entry point and actually route it through your proxy if you wish to do that. Okay, so we're gonna use exactly the same process as we used for exposing our Nginx container. So let's head over to rules and policies. We're then gonna to wanna to hit the NAT tab. We're then gonna walk through the DNAT wizard. We're gonna specify in here the Docker host IP. In here, you're gonna to wanna to specify your WAN IP, usually port B if you've been following my setup. You're then gonna specify which service you want it to be enabled on. So for this, it's port 51820 and the protocol is UDP. Remember to add this as a service to make your life easier. You can specify here which territories you want to be able to access this. You might just want to limit this to the country that you reside in. And then we get the summary and then we can go ahead and create that rule. And then that'll create the firewall rules and the DNAT rules so that all traffic will be forwarded to your Docker IP, which will then be routed internally to that container. So now that we've got the container set up and we've got our port forwarding enabled, 
let's go ahead and test this out. So on Android, simply download the app, open it, and then hit the plus at the bottom of the screen and import via a QR code. Then as I showed you, just scan the QR code on the WG Easy GUI. That will then prompt you to name the connection. Once you've done that, it will then import that into WireGuard. You can then click on it to verify the credentials. And once you've confirmed it, you can just hit the toggle to start using it. Do make sure that you change the DNS name for your server. And once you've done that, you should be up and running. So let's go ahead and test that. So I've connected to my WireGuard server. This is allowing me to ping internal services. And as you can see, I'm able to access my PyHole instance on my internal network as though I was local, which is exactly what we're after. So for now, I'm basically able to access all of my services remotely. And you can restrict that access by putting in things like network policies, IP whitelists, span lists, etc. We're not going to go into that on in this video, but just know that those are possible. So if you do want to invite other people, you can restrict their access quite granularly. So there we go. In 10 minutes, we've been able to configure and deploy a WireGuard container, which is going to give you access remotely to all of your services internally. Not only is this great for administration, it's also useful to give to other people so they can connect to your instances securely.